Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. We're back with a bit more news. Well, obviously, let's talk about Nagorno Karabakh first, then we switch over to the Ukrainian front. Armed forces of this Artsakh Republic, they surrendered weapons, and uh, this whole event seems to be, well, finally over. Apparently, there have been some atrocities and, and everything, which sadly wouldn't, wasn't a surprise here. Everything could have could have gone much better or much worse, but um, you know all of this. Well, I don't know. I don't know how is this really settling everything over, but um, I don't know how the peace the peace talks are going to go. But um, well, for now, I hope that the Azerbaijani government have well assumed some sort of authority in the region and everything. But there's another story tied to this one, which is. Um, Really interesting. See, apparently, apparently, Azerbaijan said uh, yesterday that its soldiers mistakenly opened fire in a vehicle in Karabakh, believing it belonged to illegal Armenian forces, apparently due to rain and fog and difficult terrain conditions, which resulted in the deaths of five Russian soldiers. One Russian soldier lost his life due to the fire opened by Armenian insurgent groups as well, said a statement from the Azerbaijani Prosecutor General's office. Quote, on September the 20th, a group of Azerbaijani soldiers participating in counter-terrorism activities in the rural area of Kantayak village in the Teter, sorry, Terter region mistook a vehicle carrying Russian peacekeeping forces personnel for a vehicle belonging to illegal Armenian forces and opened fire due to difficult terrain, conditions, rain and fog. As a result of the incident, five personnel of the Russian peacekeeping forces lost their lives. Uh, apparently one of them, for some reason, was the commander of the North Sea Submarine Fleet. I don't know what he was doing there, but uh, that's what my sources say. And, well, Peskov didn't really react to this, you know, just the beginning of investigation and all that whatnot. But this is important and relevant to the fact that um, it just shows how Russia is actually dependent on Turkey, no matter, you know, how much they would like to admit it or deny it. You see, at the beginning of this war, many of you probably have forgotten, but I do remember... There was, uh, you know, the, the Russians showed how Ukrainians apparently had blown up a kind of a, a rusty car. But basically, the, those all fa forgery and fakes. There was obviously forgery and fakes. But, um, you know, Russians blew up some sort of a very old Vizik was car and uh, claimed that there was a Ukrainian assassination attempt on the leaders of the Donetsk People's Republic. And they also found some old barn in the middle of nowhere, which they kind of, you know, also exploded and then told that, oh no, it's been some sort of border control post or something, something. And uh, that's what they used to justify the invasion of Ukraine at the beginning. And right now we have Azerbaijanis openly stating that, oopsies, we just killed five of your soldiers. Uh, one of them was kind of a car colonel. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, won't happen again. Whoopsies. And nothing. Absolutely nothing is happening there. It's just because, uh, yeah, put in... Um, Putin only pretends to be very strong. He doesn't actually care about anything. This just shows that the Russians, Russia's top brass do not care about their soldiers or anything, and all this is, is just nonsense. The worst part is that, uh, yeah, they haven't even talked about this in, in Z channels anywhere else. They just don't do that. And why is that? Well, because Azerbaijan has Turkey as its ally, and Russia is totally dependent on Turkey because Erdogan is now, you know, doing things for his own benefit and helping Russia, you know, sort of go past the sanctions, go kind of, he's still willing to deal with, with, with Russia somehow because he has some foreign currency and he's been, you know, moving in there and trying to be at least neutral to that. And, and uh, Russia is now more and more dependent on these, these people. This is why I think even Kim Chen in can declare his own rules to Russia. And they're much more dependent on the very few allies that they have remaining well, not allies, but like just, just people who would even talk to them than, than anything else. Because they used to drum up this, we will protect Russian soldiers everywhere all the time and there's going to be wrath and everything. Yeah, and then you don't. And then you just disregard this and just, you know, throw it under the rug. No one cared. Nothing special happened. Kind of weird. Same with, same with all these magical red lines and everything that, that happened, uh, you know, about Crimea and everything. Because, well, once again, things that seemed shocking a week ago in this war, well, right now they're pretty much commonplace. Because Russian Black Sea Fleet headquarters were hit in a missile strike once again. Head of Annex Sevastopol, 
said that Ukrainian army, army had launched a missile strike on the Russian Black Sea, Black sea headquarters. And, well, apparently they really blew up the whole building of the these headquarters. People died, obviously. We don't know how many yet, and, and it's a massive blow against the, the whole command of the Black Sea fleet, which may, may, means that it's going to be way easier for Ukraine to enforce their they're part of the grain deal. Basically, the fact that, uh, well, not even grain deal, Ukraine doesn't need the grain deal. The fact that they can just ensure that the ships that come to Ukrainian ports to pick up grain will be able to move through. And the thing is, the thing is, this should totally show that whatever Dmitry Medvedev said in 2022 about there will be hell in Armageddon if something in Crimea is hit, and, and Shoigu this year in June or something also stated that this is going to be awful if anything in Crimea is hit, it's going to be an escalation of aggression. Yeah, nothing's happening. Well, nothing out of the ordinary, that is. And the worst part is that, uh, yeah, and the first and the first part of everything, Russian government continues to deny anything actually happening, even when we have photos, geolocated photos of the destroyed building and headquarters. And it's still like, oh no, all the missiles were shot down, it's just the debris, nothing ever happened. Please don't, please look at the other direction, everything's going according to plan. It's just really silly, to be honest. Don't really understand how and why and everything, but... They just continue to lie. And at this point, at this point, it's gone to the fact where even, even those very Putinoid war correspondents, and I have to kind of split them apart. There are Z guys who used to, um, still some of them are, Girkin's buddies, you know. They, they have been yelling at the incompetence of the Russian military leadership for a long while already. But there are also those who are like kind of larger, the official Kremlin-sanctioned, quote-unquote, independent war correspondents coming from the Russian side, who've been, like, very lately been, you know, been reined in after Prigozhin's death and everything, and they have been just um, just kind of being more silent about everything happening there and just very positive about all the events and everything. Even they, even they have been extremely active on on, on this case and, and yelling that, you know, a bit much. This is a bit much about lying and all, all this stuff. But this just shows that nothing's going to change there. And also... It shows that Russia cannot get into any new conflicts and that Russia is truly throwing everything they've got at Ukraine. And there's not going to be any nukes. There's not going to be anything Russia is doing. Like, Russia is using everything that they possibly can without NATO getting directly involved in Russia, which they, in the conflict, which they are massively afraid of. And, you know, nothing's going to, nothing's going to change about that. There's no magical, miraculous Russia with extreme reserves. They have everything out there. And we're gone to the point where... Um, I don't know, more, more pro-Putin, Western media, and Shoigu himself, you know, just because, just because the massive and huge and still dangerous Russian army did not run away at the first sign of danger, they're starting to do that right now in little groups because of Zagreb the Trads and lack of ammunition and all this stuff. But, uh, you know, the, just the fact that Russian army actually managed, managed to kind of dig in and not run away instantly, that's presented as some sort of a massive, massive Russian victory, which, you know, seems a bit, a bit silly to me if, <laughs> if you, you know, if you ask me. At the same time, of course, uh, what Russia is doing in retaliation is, as usual, attacking civilian targets and everything. There have been first strikes uh, against the Ukrainian energy infrastructure once again. They're starting to do this in September right now, which is why the new uh, aid package from the United States to Ukraine, more entire defenses have been included and more rockets to them. Still no Atakums missiles. I don't know why those are not in. Because if Ukraine would just be given everything they need to, to win the war, I'm pretty sure war, war would be over faster. But uh, yeah, these attacks continue. Russia launched 15 of them overnight on September 23rd. The drones were launched from the Russian town of primorsko arkhartsk in the region of Krasnodar Krai and directed towards Ukraine's Zaporizhia and Dnipropetrovsk regions. Ukraine's air force managed to destroy 14 of these drones in this region. Twelve drones were shut down in the Dnipropetrovsk region, according to Nikolai Lukashuk, chairman of the regional council over there. According to him, a crit critical infrastructure target was damaged in Dnipro, and that target, and the target as we know, well, at least as I know, is uh, some sort of um, distribution system for electricity, so about 326 villages in various regions, well, they were you know, left uh, without electricity. But at this point, you have to admit that Ukrainians are, well, pretty good, at getting their electricity back up running and getting it fixed. But, uh, you know, this is going to continue. There's going to be more attacks. 
But I, I don't think Russia can get back onto the front foot of, of this whole thing. I don't think they can grab back the initiative, at least not in the traditional sense. But of course, well, <laughs> not everything is shiny and nice, but we have some other interesting things. In the meanwhile in Russia section, we also have something called meanwhile in the EU. Apparently, apparently Politico reported that uh, EU sanctions against Russians are being imposed based on information hastily assembled from Wikipedia and other open sources. I hope I am on those open sources, but, you know, probably not. Otherwise, the sanctions would be much more targeted and, uh, you know, a bit better than, than those that they're using. Apparently... Apparently, the materials on which the conclusions are based include machine translations of articles from Russian and Ukrainian sources and short profiles of businessmen from Forbes. That's a bit silly. I mean, and by bit, I mean um, quite a lot. Because I think, I think if they would just, just listen to my show for a bit, they'd be a bit better off than uh, whatever it is that they're basing their sanctions list and accusations currently. But, you know, not all is lost, thankfully, because... Not just the EU bureaucrats tend to do, tend to do silly things, but uh, we have the common, usual, meanwhile, in the Russia segment. First of all, in Krasnodar territory, a veteran of the special military operation from the war returned, who returned from the front, gave um, a gift to a 12-year-old schoolboy. The gift was a live grenade, you know, and kind of an explosive one, not one of those flashbacks. Uh, yeah, the, thankfully, the kid's parents were... Um, very attentive, and took that thing away from him, and then reported him, and the, the, the military man was arrested. But, uh, well, you know, nice gift for Christmas these years, grenades and everything. Pretty sure that's not the only case, and many of them won't be caught. But while we're out at the kid, uh, the kid things, well, uh, in the Magadan Junior High, yeah, Magadan is a real place, and people are there, but there are, like, uh, new activities in that, which, which the various regional governors do. And, uh, well, right now, they're, they're being taught how to read from the ABC about important things. This comes from an article from um, Ria Novosti. So usually, it is like, because of how, how, all these, how all these things work, standards like, uh, I'm not going to translate, it used to be A, Arbuz, B, Belichka, V, Volk, because it's ABV in Cyrillic, and it would be like, Watermelon, Squirrel, Wolf, that's like, it starts with ABV there. And now we have patriotic designations for this. Mm-hmm. And, and I have some that, that starts there. A is for army, defenders of the country uh, and our pride. B is for God, Boh. We are Russian, God is with us. That's first graders who are being taught, you know, how to read, basically. C, sorry, mm-hmm. V, like, because Oda translates, for unknown reasons, uh, in this context, translates V for C, because, uh, you know, I put this stuff in depot, then I go over it, so it happens. Mm-hmm. A, B, V. V is for veteran, a man who brings victory and peace to our country. D is for hero, Geroy. That is G. Oh, man. A is for army, B is for God, V is for veteran, G is for hero, D is for volunteer, and P is for president. And it's kind of like, volunteer is a true patriot of the fatherland, and hero, the fa- uh, as been taught to kids, is every warrior is a hero. He goes into battle today for freedom, for Russia. May God give him strength. And the president only protects and develops the country. I mean, ugh, this is just a bit silly. I have to, like, sometimes I feel silly for just, you know, reading over stuff and fixing obvious mistakes because, yeah, ugh, didn't know I didn't know I have to check out that other thing. Yeah, it's 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 nonsense, and they have ultra patriotic thing because you have to teach the kids how to run things from the grade first. But not to end this on a on a more depressing note. Because everything's been sad lately, especially those two episodes with with me and Alex. But uh, I have I have something something good for you, something we haven't had for a while, something that truly brings warmth to my heart and, and joy to my senses. You know, something that we've all missed here on the eastern border, and that is of course news from Igor Girkin. Yes, 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 yes. He uh, dictated a text to his lawyer, transmitted through his lawyer uh, Molochov. Now what happened there is. Um, he wrote about why, what happens there, and uh, he tries to answer the question to his own supporters of did Strelkov really go crazy by putting towards six theses about why he's better than Putin? And, and Igor Girkin responds to this from prison uh, through to his lawyer. And you know what? I think it's actually better than the Viennese letter. I mean, just saying, just saying. It's shorter and, well, 
full of, um, if you're a person like me, and you are because you're listening to this show, full of enjoyment and happiness because a lot of you, I know a lot of you have missed Girkin. So here we go. <clears throat> the Troubles are taking place in the Russian Federation. The, the Troubles refers to time of Troubles with Lzhe Dmitris and all that stuff. It's like earlier. The Troubles are taking place in the Russian Federation. Or rather, its acute stage is evident. The start of which was Prigozhin's rebellion and its continuation was his elimination. The ongoing... Uh, the ongoing severe uh, military, special military operation with unclear prospects makes it impossible to stabilize the situation within the framework of the bureaucratic oligarchic consensus that has existed for more than two decades. At the same time, the persistent attempts of the Russian authorities to respond to the most pressing problems and challenges without fundamentally changing anything are clearly being demonstrated. This means that sooner or later, the troubles will enter their terminal stage. An uncontrolled collapse of the entire system of pub public administration is possible. At the same time, at the moment in the political field of the Russian Federation, there is a complete absence of a positive patriotic force capable of at least influencing the development of the situation. And the only alternative to the current bureaucratic oligarchic system, also experiencing a severe crisis, is the so-called liberal opposition which still possesses, despite certain reprisals, serious material resources bro bro both abroad and within the country. I'm not sure which country, though, because they don't have anything inside Russia, and they're a bit iffy anyways. Carrying on. With a further deepening of the troubles, one can predict a situation in which the current power system will lose its levers of control in one way or another, and they will end up in the hands of the above-mentioned liberals. Oh no, such horrors. Since there are no forces or figures opposing them on the official field. At the moment, I consider it my duty to make every effort to create at least the basis for uniting the not-sick patriotic forces as a third force. I perfectly understand all the weaknesses of my current position, all the problems with my lack of necessary resources, and I do not at all overestimate the degree of my authority and influence. However, someone needs to rise first, if only to set up an example and call others to action, to put up a flag. It is quite possible that this attempt is doomed to, to, to failure. You don't think and is premature. It is even more likely that my own figure will not be able to attract the required attention and resources. I actually kind of hope it does. That would just, that would just be insane if they, you know, start messing everything up, because Girkin versus Kremlin is awesome. Carrying on. Well, all of the above is taken into account by me. I hope that my example will motivate other people and other forces from among those who now do not dare to act as leaders of the national patriotic movement or consider such an attempt to be meaningless and useless. My point, my point of view is that it is too late to be afraid and wait. We are on the eve of the collapse of the Russian statehood. God, God forbid that I'm wrong. Someone has to be first. Not my first time, by the way. Igor, Igor Strelkov, Girkin. September 15, 2023. Well, now that's just purely amazing. Girkin wants to start now revolutions and fights and from the prison and now... Now it's more than guaranteed that he will just never leave that place. At least, you know, not alive. But, okay then. We'll keep you updated on everything. I hope that there will be more attacks from the whole front line, uh, from Ukraine to Sevastopol and other places. I hope the grain shipments go through. Today we already know about three more ships that are going to come and pick up grain from Ukraine. I hope all goes well. I have to check up on more global news as well. Like I said, we're living in interesting times. And I don't even know how how this whole thing is gonna end up happening on, on such. We have uh, we have more interviews planned. Uh, I intend to be on the Secret Police podcast when he gets me on my show. We also have other invitations, and I'm gonna do some thing with um, a podcast group, which wanted to maybe a bit more better advertising than Acast, but we'll see how that goes. It's gonna be fun. Either way. I'd very much appreciate if you would uh, consider becoming our patron. If you like the content, please go to patreon.com slash the eastern border. Or you can just go to the eastern border .lv and click the donate button. We'd be very, very happy for that. That pays our bills and makes sure that I actually, you know, have some food. And, well, you know, planning to get married, pretty much all the expensive stuff. So if you could do that, that'd be very nice. But if not, or if you can't afford it, well, then I just hope that you have learned something new today and that you enjoy the show. До свидания, товарищи. And as always, remember, happiness is mandatory. Oh, 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 one, one thing, though, one thing, though. We're going to be watching uh, the peculiarities of the National Hunt series 
on Discord with my patrons. So this is a good time to become a patron because, you know, this month I won't charge patrons for more of my episodes and you can still manage to see the movies with us while streaming that stuff. And that's going to be great. Secondly, uh, I'm going to add the Discord link because I like to see you guys on Discord because it's a very, it's like the best social social media platform that I know. I interact there, well, this week less than others, but pretty much I'm, I'm there almost constantly because I like to talk to everyone on that, that platform. The link will be in the easternboard.lv page. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure where you get this in ACOS. I'm not sure if the link should up there, but you can just go to the easternboard.lv and just, this is going to be, the Discord link is going to be under the description of this episode. So yeah, that's about it. Once again, that's Svidenia.